thought leadership from PwC. Welcome to PwC's Accounting Podcast. I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for joining me as we continue our new Tuesday series where one of our all-star podcast guests will be taking over the podcast, picking the topics of the month, and joining me for all the episodes. For the month of February, our takeover guest is Andrea Sol, and our topic is human capital. If you haven't already checked out the first two episodes this month on macroeconomic and demographic trends leading to the scarcity of human capital, as well as the intersection of human capital and financial reporting, please check those out. But don't change the channel yet. You can listen to any of these episodes on a standalone basis. Most of the sustainability reporting frameworks are at least in part or entirely based on providing information that's decision useful for investors, so information that's relevant to calculating the enterprise value of the of the company. What does good, better, and best really look like, right? Um, and whether it's the, in the context of my organization, whether it's in the context of you know comparing me externally, and so you know when we talk to companies about how do you how do you potentially think about it, it's you know looking at the footprint of your organization. This week, Andreas is joined by Cherie Wyatt, a PwC deals partner and sustainability specialist who helps clients execute on their ESG reporting strategies. They're here to discuss how we're seeing companies communicate the value of human capital through ESG reporting. You'll also hear their insights on the interaction between ESG reporting and financial reporting and where they think this is all headed with the numerous proposals from regulators and standard setters. So with all that, let's get started. So Andreas, Shree, thanks so much for joining me today for part three of our Human Capital podcast series. And we've talked in some of our previous episodes about macroeconomic trends and how that's impacting the workforce and also how human capital is considered or perhaps more accurately not considered from a financial reporting perspective. But today's episode is really going to focus in on human capital disclosures in sustainability reporting, which is definitely a topic. I know Andreas and I are spending a lot of time on, and Shri, I think it's probably pretty much all you are spending time on today. But perhaps, Andreas, before we get started, can you just re-level set for us where we are from the first two episodes and what we should be thinking about now? Sure. So in the first two episodes, what we talked about was this idea that there are demographic and political and other developments that are leading us to a place where the workforce is not going to be growing in the future, maybe even shrinking in the U.S. and, frankly, in other developed countries as well. And what that means is we are the scarcity of human capital that people are dealing with right now may not be a short-term phenomenon. And what does that mean? Well, if you have scarcity of assets, typically that means their price goes up. And so to the extent that people are going to have to pay more for human capital, they're going to have to focus more on whether they're creating value with that uh, human capital that's sort of commensurate to the investment slash price that they're paying. And so one of the things we talked about was just this idea of viewing human capital as an asset. And when you think about assets in general, you think about, I make investments in them or I make expenditures that maintain them. And when I make investments, I want to earn an adequate return on that. Then we said, hey, a lot of those types of dynamics are not really captured in the financial statements for a whole bunch of reasons we won't rehash. And I think today we're going to talk about how at least some of these concepts can make their way into uh, a properly designed ESG or sustainability reporting scheme. Well, and I guess not to preempt our entire discussion, but I think this is perhaps a place that sustainability reporting has an advantage over financial reporting because we do report human capital. I guess the question is, do we really reflect the fact it's an asset? So maybe that's a good lead in to sort of digging into this a little bit. And um, Cherie, before we get into some of the debate, can you just give us an overview of the state of reporting as it relates to human capital in sustainability ESG reporting 
I don't know, many people say climate reporting, even when they're talking about human capital reporting. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, so, you know, as Andreas had mentioned, there's, there's very limited human capital information in the financial statement footnotes. In fact, 2020, when the SEC made amendments to the SK rules was really the first time that we started to get a glimpse at the need for um, greater transparency coming from investor demands. You just think about the footnotes. I mean, other than maybe pensions and post retirement benefits, there's really very few areas where you would expect to get the type of data that, that investors are looking for to, for them to understand kind of the risks and opportunities there. So when we think about sustainability reporting being that gap from a financial reporting perspective, um, I think one of the biggest challenges is that um, many of the frameworks today are voluntary. So when you think about SASB, GRI, um, you know, WEF, et cetera, um, you know, all of them are on a voluntary basis, which creates some challenges for investors in order to get the information that they need, starting to think about comparability across um, you know, companies and sectors. Um, and, and I would also say that the disclosures are very much kind of factual point in time. Here's a metric, um, without really kind of linking it to the financial impact, the risks and opportunities, how well they may be managed or potentially mismanaged, which is really where I think, um, you know, like the SEC and some other kind of regulatory uh, regimes really have an opportunity to, to draw that linkage, just con considering the fact that human capital is such a critical asset. Um, that just doesn't you know, currently generate much transparency in how it's managed. Um, you know, I, in thinking about kind of the future, and I know Andreas, you're going to talk about this a little later. I do think CSRD um, uh, will start to kind of bridge some of that gap in marrying, um, you know, financial impacts and, and human capital. So I'm excited to see how that kind of plays out. But again, that's very kind of limited to you know EU. You know, what are what are we going to require here in the U.S.? And I think absent that, we probably will still see this gap um, in terms of how people are are transparently reporting how they manage human capital. Resources resources. Well, and I think not to rehash our past episodes, but even the examples you gave from a financial reporting point of view, Sheree, of pension and post-retirement benefits, I think if you were to ask 99 out of 100, if not 100 people, that is purely cost yes. information. <laughs> that is not you know, benefit, except for from the point of view of the employee. And I, I do think that's one of the issues. But even with that, and I know we'll get into some of the reporting, I do think there's still a gap even in sustainability reporting of linking some of these statistics and otherwise to why that's beneficial to the company. And so maybe just to start, Sheree, what are some of the best practices that you're seeing and does it help close that gap? I would say not yet, but let me hit on some of the best practices. So when we think about what we've seen companies gravitate to over the past, let's call it two or three years, I would say diversity, equity, inclusion is probably um, one of the major areas where we've seen companies start to provide additional information. I think the challenge is that it's been very metrics-based. So what's your representation, gender, racial, ethnicity, et cetera, um, but not necessarily tying it to kind of getting back to Andres's point, the investments that you're making in it, the return that you're generating, where do you see see that value creation um, associated with the investments that you're making in, say, diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. So we definitely saw a double down on DEI, but it still feels very much kind of a bit of a compliance check the box. We provide this information um, as opposed to kind of more strategic. Um, and I think, you know, I think that really um, is a symptom of companies, you know, struggling to determine and articulate, like, how do I really... Um, determine what the uh, return on investment is for my programs and initiatives that I have around DEI, you know, kind of recruiting, retention, et cetera, um, to really get that full stakeholder buy-in beyond kind of it being, it's the right thing to do. And so, Sri, can I ask a question then? Because as you were speaking, I was thinking with climate, it's relatively straightforward. You want GHG emissions to go down. I mean, there's more complexity than that, but it's fairly easy that if someone's GHG number is high and getting higher, that is bad. And if it's low and getting lower, that's good. I'll use those words in quotes. But diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's not so easy, I'll use that word, to say what is best, right? Is, you know, we know we want it, but what is it that we're exactly looking for? And that feels like that's contributing to this gap you're talking about, but just curious if that ever comes up 
in any of your conversations. It definitely does. It's like, what does good, better, and best really look like, right? Um, and whether it's the, in the context of my organization, whether it's in the context of, you know, comparing me externally. And so, you know, when we talk to companies about how do you, how do you potentially think about it, it's, you know, looking at the footprint of your organization, where do you do business, the demographics of your customers, um, the dem- demographics of, you know, the, um, the, the different business units that you're operating in. And does that give a, g- g- help you understand where you may want to drive deeper around diversity? Um, so for example, if you tend to do, you know, substantially all of your business in, um, really diverse communities, inner cities and things like that, um, does hiring and having a more diverse workplace to be able to serve those communities, um, one, not only create opportunities for the communities that you serve, but also kind of create that, um, loyalty that will generate greater kind of customer retention and growth. Right. So, um, so I, th- I think companies are, are fairly early in that journey and trying to understand, um, where to kind of place the, you know, place the right resources to be able to drive those returns. Um, but I think what investors are struggling with is just the lack of transparency to even understand where those risk and opportunities may lie. So you're making a point that the first step is to have the numbers and then you can start thinking about what they mean in the context of that particular business. That's right. Cause otherwise you don't know, you know, is this good that I only have, you know, 10% women again, exaggerating 10% women in my workforce. Right. Um, and just because maybe my closest competitor may have higher, does that mean that that's the right for my business? And I just think that very intentional thought process around it, as opposed to kind of throwing, you know, money and resources sources at it without really being able to tell the story or why really starts to limit um, some of the stakeholder um, kind of buy-in on the actions that you're taking. So then Andreas, if we've reported the information, we're starting to show value. How are some of the ways that we've seen companies think about it? Yeah. So maybe just to step back, right? Most of the sustainability reporting frameworks are at least in part or entirely based on providing information that's decision useful for investors, so information that's relevant to calculating the enterprise value of the of the company. And there's kind of two ways, I would say, to think about enterprise value of the company, right? You can do the classic, what's the present value of the cash flows? The other way to do it is, what are the value of the assets less the liabilities? But you have to put all the assets on the books, all the intangibles, including, including human capital. And so the way I think about this disclosure regime is a lot of the sustainability um, reporting requirements, they don't say specifically you must do these exact 10 things. It's, it's not quite like the accounting rules where you have to disclose certain things about inventory or you have to s- disclose certain things about pensions. It's a bit more principles based. And so the idea is supposed to be you're supposed to disclose the information that has a link back to value. So if I think about in the human capital space, in many industries, involuntary turnover is very costly. And so if you can reduce that, that's value creating for a whole bunch of reasons, right? You don't have to recruit the people. You don't have to train new people. You don't have to have them go through the trouble of rebuilding relationships with your customers and clients, all, all, all those kinds of things. So I think the exercise of preparing you know, high quality or what we call investor grade uh, sustainability reporting is you go through that process of thinking about what are the... The, the metrics or dynamics of in the human capital space that are linked to value and then explain in your report what that link is. And then you start to have these metrics that are tied to that. So turnover being a uh, involuntary turnover being a you know classic one, but we can also do that with some of the, uh, you know, the, the DNI statistics and, and a number of other um, human capital metrics that you can, kind of create that uh, create that bridge, which then I guess in theory would also impact internal reporting and the types of things you start uh, you start tracking. So you know a good example of that is you know Cherie mentioned CSRD, which is the uh, you know the reporting regime in Europe that by the way doesn't just apply to European companies as we covered on other podcasts. It applies to anyone operating in Europe, not just headquartered there. But they have a number of standards that get at various issues around uh, around human capital. And so one of the things they have in there is to really dissect training. 
and make you, you know, look at a number of metrics around what kind of investment are you making in training? You know, how many hours are people getting trained? Is does it differ by sort of like demographic group? How, how are you tracking the effectiveness of the training? And if you think about it, I mean, that's one of the ways that you enhance the value of your human capital is through training, but it's got to be training that's the right training for the right people. It has to be effective. And are you doing things to measure that um, effectiveness when you're deciding how much time and resource do I invest in, uh, in, in training? So that's an example of where there's something in the standards that's specifically getting at this information where you can say, okay, now I as an investor can look at that and say, okay, based on these disclosures, I have some level of comfort that management has their arms around how much money they're investing in various uh, initiatives around human capital, and that they're not only are they investing in the right places, but they're investing the right amount, and they're doing something that is sensible to assess whether those investments are actually yielding a, uh, an adequate return. All right. So, Andreas, I, I think that's interesting, and it's something we've talked about in some of our other episodes. I still do think, though, there's a disconnect between just because you're spending money on training, does that really mean that it translates into return for shareholders and otherwise? And I, I think that's still where there's a question about how is human capital really an asset? I think it's a fair criticism because I don't think people generally are measuring whether they're getting an appropriate return on training. And I think, like I said, some of these uh, disclosures in the ESG world will force you to at least think about that in a way that maybe hasn't been done in the past. But yeah, I think that's maybe one of the, one of the fundamental sort of concepts here is when you're spending on R&D or spending on building a brand, you know, advertising or sales and marketing, there's at least typically some effort to say, am I getting an adequate return on that spend? I don't know that most companies are doing much to explicitly try to capture that on training. There's sort of this, well, we have to do training and more training is directionally better. Um, I don't know. It's just my, my, my sense. Yeah. I mean, Sheree, from a practical point of view, does this come up when you're working with companies or not? Are people still more at the mechanical stage of let's report what we're doing? Yeah, I think it's more at the mechanical stage right now. I would say also the the training discussion has definitely been more qualitative as opposed to kind of quantitative and translating it um, to kind of what value it ultimately is, is creating for the company. I also think it's maybe challenging to really determine, right? you know, yes, I do this training because it's going to help with quality. It's going to help prevent, you know, product you know, defects and things like that. But do I know for that particular training module that if I hadn't done it, um, and I hadn't invested in it, that my product quality and, and kind of my quality, my deliverables, et cetera, would be that much more different. Right. Um, and so I, but I think to Andreas's point, this, the, these ESG standards are going to start to kind of force that consideration, especially when it becomes, um, involuntary through some of the regulatory requirements. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point and probably a good lead in to my next question, which is bringing together ESG reporting and financial reporting. So Sheree, you know, if again, let's take this training example or DE and I statistics or otherwise you report in your sustainability reporting, how does this interact if, if at all with your financial reporting? Yeah, I, I think we're evolving to that, Heather, um, to be honest, right? So I think we started to see that here in the U.S. with what the SEC was was doing, but it was very principles-based, right? And so, and, and I think the outcome of those requirements from, from back in 2020, um, were, were, we saw a lot of diversity in what companies were actually disclosing. And it really became more of a, okay, I need to say something about training because it's something important. It's something I'm investing in, but really not tying it back to, um, how am I managing it? How does it kind of impact, um, potential investor returns? How am I getting a return on that investment? And so I think that, 
um, many of these new standards that, that we're, that we're expecting will help to kind of bridge that gap a, a bit. Having said that, you know, here in the U S we are seeing the SEC, um, look to take more, uh, more action around human capital, um, meaning wanting to get more prescriptive around what's, what's going to be disclosed, um, and really trying to, you know, tie back to the principle of why investors are asking for this information. So it starts to become less of that kind of check the box and more kind of proactive and strategic. So I think, Sheree, that's, I think, helpful perspective. I know, Andreas, I have to bring you into this conversation because we've spent so much time talking about the fact that there's a lot of intangible assets that aren't measured in the financial statements, human capital being one of them. And so how do you see this evolving? Do you think ultimately we will see things like human capital on the balance sheet? I think both the FASB and the ISB have projects on their agenda in various stages of uh, priority to look at uh, intangible assets and the uh, particularly internally generated intangibles and with an eye towards getting better information on them in the financial statements, which doesn't automatically mean putting more things on the balance sheet, right? It might start with disclosure. Um, the other thing it might mean is that they take a two track approach, right? There's certain types of intangibles, brands and technology where there's a, you know, kind of a legal underpinning. It's very well defined what it is that you, uh, that you own, you can transact in it relatively, relatively easily generally that those may be something where if you were going to put something on the balance sheet, you'd start with those because they're just more tangible intangibles. <laughs> <laughs> that um, seems like an oxymoron. Seems like an oxymoron, right? Whereas uh, human capital, as we've talked about, is a little bit more challenging because it isn't actually the actual person because you, you know, you don't own your employees or your staff. Um, it's more the intellectual, um, you know, capital that exists in, in those people. And it exists in a pool of people, which means that when one person leaves, it doesn't, they don't take it all with them. It stays behind and can get trans transmitted to the new people who join the, uh, the organization that, that is a little bit more difficult to define from an accounting perspective, like what exactly it is. And you have to always define things very succinctly before you can, before you can measure them. So they will certainly be talking about it, but it's quite possible that because of some of those challenges around definition, that that would be a class of assets where you start with disclosures and then you'll have this question of, well, which disclosures around things like human capital and other intangibles are best found inside the financial statements versus in the sustainability report. And frankly, if you read some of the materials of the sustainability standard setters, you know, there's some people who think, well, maybe there's some things that belong in both places. I don't know if that's necessarily optimal, but, but the idea that, um, more information is going to make its way into the financial statements over time. It's really the only way you can keep financials relevant as the economy continues to shift more and more towards a intangible based world. Yeah. And I, I do think there's a difference between human capital and let's say a brand or otherwise, because even if you think about human capital, you gave the example of the person leaving. Well, if you have a thousand people, maybe one person isn't as important unless that's the person who has some very specialized knowledge you need. And then what if you only have 10 people? Now you've just lost 10% of your assets. So I do think there's definitely some complications. I don't want anyone listening to think <laughs> that we're suggesting in the near term, we're going to see human capital in the financial statements. I think the reason this is an important discussion is because this link between sustainability reporting and financial reporting and the fact stakeholders are are using other forms of information, including, you know, the sustainability report as they're thinking about a company's value, all kind of ties together. Now, Sheree, I have a question for you before we get into where we think it's going from a sustainability point of view. We did see new rules. You alluded to them a couple of times from the SEC. My time has all merged together since the pandemic, but I believe that was in the fall of 2020. I hope that was correct. So that's two reporting cycles. We're in our third reporting cycle. Uh, what impact has that had? What is the quality of what we're seeing? And maybe, Andreas, then, if you have any insight into if people are actually using that information. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the first year we obviously saw, you know, a lot of companies uh, really trying to understand, pull together the data to make, uh, to make the disclosures. Uh, 
you know, we didn't. So when I think about the disclosures that we saw in that first reporting cycle, um, still heavily qualitative, um, with the exception of certain areas, you know, like like DEI, um, where we did see some quantitative information. But that's more or less been the same in these uh, kind of past two, uh, you know, cycles. And I and currently what we're maybe expecting in this in this current reporting. Um, I think many are kind of taking a bit of a wait and see on what the SEC may be requiring if they um, modify the modify the rules, and we're expecting a proposal in the in the April timeframe um, because we didn't see many comments comments coming through from the SEC around human capital disclosures, right? So I think it kind of left companies feeling like, okay, well, I guess I did, you know, good enough because I didn't receive you know a comment there, um, even though I think when when we were looking looking at, you know, a variety of different disclosures, it still kind of felt like, okay, DI is important. Here's kind of, you know, the programs and initiatives that I have here are my metrics, but it really wasn't very kind of action oriented or goal oriented, um, or definitely not kind of tying back to, you know, how this, you know, creates you know, value for, for investors. Um, so I'm optimistic as we start to kind of continue down this path, whether it's the SEC or what's going on over in the EU that, as Andrea said, will impact. Uh, yeah, U.S.-based companies as well that will start to see a better linkage um, you know, between um, those disclosures and uh, kind of financial reporting and, and value creation for, for companies. And sure, let me ask a follow-up question because I think right around the time that those uh, disclosures were issued, or those required disclosures were issued, obviously there was a lot of heavy focus on various aspects of human capital, including DEI. Are you continuing to see a substantive focus from companies? They're waiting on changing reporting, but they're continuing to make changes and and to kind of consider how their workforce is an asset, or is that was that a little bit of a trend of the moment and now it's maybe less of a focus or maybe some of both? It's a really great question. I would say it's probably um, a mix of both. Um, you know, I do think that right now companies are obviously heavily focused on the current economic environment, but also kind of the climate um, activities that are occurring here, here in the U S right. So I don't want to say that companies have stopped focusing on it. I do still think it's a priority. Um, but we also know that companies have a lot of demands, right? And so, um, so that's where, you know, when we think about the evolution of the disclosures, um, back when the first year we were in the heat of, of 2020. And so we saw a lot from, uh, you know, a health and safety perspective and the investments that, you know, uh, companies were making in people, um, for, for, for those times, then we kind of fast forward to kind of 21, 22, and it was a great resignation. So you start to see a little bit of the, um, kind of evolution of the disclosure aligned to um, what's kind of top of mind for, for corporates um, and wanting to you know, better articulate kind of how they're managing those risks and where they see see those potential opportunities. Um, so so I, I think we're I think we're gonna start to see kind of better refinement of that. Um, I don't want to fully suggest that companies are kind of you know uh, completely wait and see, but I do think that um, there is an element of them wanting to see like how prescriptive the SEC is going to get, how much further may they need to go. Um, certainly one of the things on the SEC's kind of list of potential disclosures was around turnover and retention. And while many companies talked about that in the in their disclosures, it was definitely more qualitative. Um, certainly there's some competitive information that may arise through that. And so they were very measured in what they said. Um, but I think the expectation from at least what we've um, you know, heard from some of the staff is that there may be more kind of quantitative related information coming from that, but we're not seeing companies kind of jump to make those disclosures voluntarily. All right. That's definitely helpful and a good segue into my next question, because we've throughout this podcast kind of alluded to new rules coming, things that we expect to see. So maybe Andreas, just to summarize for the audience, we've talked before on the podcast about our big three proposals, which would be the SEC um, in the U.S. for climate, but we know they are also um, planning to propose human capital rules, and then we have the ISSB internationally, and then, as you mentioned already, CSRD in the EU. So what are we seeing in each of those sort of categories? So we're still waiting on what the SEC is going to do, hopefully in the next uh, couple of months. I think Cherie's right that uh, based on maybe how investors have reacted to the 2020 
um, rule and the fact that it has generally yielded mostly qualitative information, which then makes it very difficult for an investor to say, okay, that's all interesting, but what would I actually change on my model in terms of valuing the uh, valuing the enterprise? That we would expect that there's going to be more um, quantitative information in there, um, given that the SEC is inherently, because of its charter, investor focused. You would hope that whatever they do mandate, that there's at least some effort there to tie that to these are value oriented um, metrics as opposed to. Uh, you know, just things that someone might deem important for based on other criteria. Um, so hopefully we'll see that in the next couple months. Then we have the ISSB, um, the sister board of the folks who write the international accounting standards. And uh, they have a general sustainability standard, which covers all topics, including um, human capital matters. Um, there's not a lot in there that's really specific to human capital right now, but that organization did effectively acquire the SASB, and the SASB, their I guess their major open project at the date of the uh, of the merger was their human capital project, and so I think we understand that once they get their first two standards S1 and S2 out in the next couple of months, that prior, you know, they will turn their attention to things like how do they build the SASB standards up to the point where they can more robustly, you know, roll them into the uh, the uh, international um, sustainability standards. And I would imagine that working on that human capital piece will be part of it. They've also have an agenda document that they're going to publish in the first part of the year where they've already foreshadowed what the what the uh, areas of emphasis will be and they they highlighted four of them and one of them is human capital so my guess is that they will build on what this SASB started get some additional feedback from the market and again the ISSB is a investor oriented reporting framework so they they should be focused on you know, trying to tease out what information do investors really need to make investment decisions with respect to human capital. All right. That's super helpful. So with that, then why don't we go on to um, CSRD? And I know there's lots of specifics in those proposed standards. Yeah. So CSRD is uh, effectively done. It'll be completely done um, in uh, May, June, but we're not expecting a lot of changes between now and then. And so earlier I walked through some of the specifics around training. There is a whole um, standard on, on workforce that uh, has many more details similar to training you know there's things about turnover but then there's lot there, there's things about uh, diversity gender is uh, particularly um, on board representation and ranks of senior management and understanding what companies plans are um, and at least in part that's I think because of the uh, you know the reality of the workforce that mm -hmm. we talked about in the beginning that um, Female participation in the workforce is is one of the ways that you can deal with some of those demographic things right. we were talking about earlier. If you can increase that uh, percentage, so that is not lost on the folks who wrote these uh, standards. So, so those are some of the things I would expect to be highlighted. But again, it's it's fairly detailed. Certainly, if you compare it to you know the SEC document from 2020, it's much more detailed in terms of tell us how you th think about these various issues and what you're specifically doing to manage it. What kind of targets and goals do you have and sort of why are those the goals? And then tell us over time how you're doing in terms of meeting them. That's a, that's a real a theme that goes throughout CSRD. It's you need a goal and then you need to report how you're going to get to that goal in a you know fairly specific way. And then the ongoing reporting is tell me how you're doing towards that goal. And if you're not on track, what are you going to do about it? And often the disclosure also says, well, and who in your organization is responsible for, for getting it back on track? And you know, if you change your goal for whatever reason, including you, know, you might have better information on what makes the most sense, you, know, you have to tell us that, um, that as well. So that's the kind of specificity that's in there. But again, this, the European framework isn't just investor-oriented, right? So it's also trying to accomplish some, I'll call it, you know, broader societal objectives that aren't 
sort of company specific enterprise value orient. Well, and I think one point there, just to clarify for the audience, is that you have to report on a goal if you have one. You could say you don't have one. The CSRD right. itself can't force you to. But I think there's a sense that if you're being asked to disclose your progress to uh, a goal, that you, you probably would want one. And I would contrast this. I know this is human capital, but... Uh, in climate, we actually did see the federal government proposal would require major contractors and those who are above a um, certain threshold would be required to set science-based targets on climate. So it's a slightly different, but I think important point. Let me go back to um, Sheree, though, for a moment, because Sheree, one of the things we talked about in some of our much, much earlier conversations, so um, people might want to dig out those old podcasts, but is that we saw a lot of this type of reporting that was, um, I don't want use the word sporadic, but maybe that people would not necessarily adopt an entire framework in voluntary reporting, but they would just pick some uh, items to disclose. And is that something you're still seeing? Again, this is we're a couple years down the road. And do you think as you're working with companies, they're ready for this sort of more mandated type of disclosure? Yeah, I think a lot of the hesitation around the reporting was around the data, right, and the data quality. Um, and so that led to many companies starting to maybe pick the aspects of the different standards, but create a roadmap around, okay, we may not be able to you know, deliver this now, but we've determined that this is a material topic to us and our investors. And so here's the roadmap that we anticipated in getting there. So I think that's what we saw a lot of companies do that had the inability to maybe adopt a full standard that may have been you know relevant for for their for their business. Um, and so I do think as companies start to prepare for these more kind of regulatory um, you know standards, especially given the pervasiveness of, of CSRD and, and the requirements there, you know, we are seeing companies starting to really kind of double down and start focusing on those data needs and thinking about the fact of I want high quality financial reporting. Um, and how do I build up the right kind of process and controls in order to enable enable that, not only for just the pure fact that I need to report the numbers, but, you know, to Andreas's point, you know, very much an outcome-based, progression-based, you know, monitoring system to be able to hold, uh, you know, accountable, uh, people accountable within the organization for the actions that they're taking and the investments that they're making and how it's driving accountability and, and, and impact. So, Shri, let me ask a follow-up because our theme here is human capital is an asset, but as soon as you're talking about human capital, you're talking about people, and you're actually talking about people's very personal information. In some cases, it's amalgamated and otherwise, but maybe your employees don't want to share a lot of this information with you for reporting purposes, and that's something we've talked about in, in past podcasts, but again, is that something where you're seeing any progress, or is it something that comes companies are still going to have to struggle with as they think about these mandatory disclosures in the future? I think it'll continue to be a struggle, particularly when you think about the different kind of jurisdictions in which a company may operate, um, different definitions around kind of what it means to be, you know, from a race, ethnicity, minority versus non-minority, um, and, and how to get the right data in order to do their reporting. Um, so I do think it's going to be something that companies will continue to to kind of struggle with or into, you know, try to figure out the right kind of protocol um, around, around that reporting. Um, but certainly, you know, I think you, to the extent it's going to be required, I think it's really about how do I determine the right process, right? And the right kind of governance to ensure that I'm consistently accumulating the information to be able to report it. We did see a lot of companies that um, also really focused on um, their kind of reporting, employee voluntary reporting. So we saw a lot of self-ID campaigns. Um, but still, to your point, there, there continues to be a hesitancy around how much information that's going to be shared. How is that information going to be used? Uh, kind of that trust with the organization that is ultimately not going to hurt my career because I may not be viewed as a, as a minority and therefore I may not get access to, to certain you know, opportunities uh, that may be available to others. So um, I think we'll continue to have that debate specifically around the diversity and inclusion. I think the other areas when we start to think about hiring, recruiting, uh, turnover, you know, a little less sensitive, uh, but nevertheless still, still important to um, evaluating overall human capital. 
Yes, although I will point out to Andreas that this is one of the reasons it's way more complicated than dealing with widgets <laughs> um, and, and, and why there's, you know, it's it's not easy for standard size, which I know you acknowledge, but I think you'd yes. like to see them move faster on, on addressing some of this because you're not going to solve it unless you start talking about it. So with all of that said, I do want to bring us back together because I know we've kind of gone in a few different directions and I'm going to ask you both the same question just to wrap things up. And it's always my crystal ball question I like to go to at the end. And it was really just what you see as as the biggest challenges and the biggest opportunities for companies as they think about both sustainability reporting. And I'm going to go a little broader and just communicating the value of their workforce to their stakeholders, including their investors. And we've hit a few of these along the way, but I think this would be a great place to bring it together. So Sheree, I'll go to you first. Yeah, I guess where I see the biggest challenge is also where there's the biggest opportunity, right? So we've talked about this a lot that, you know, a lot of the companies are focused on the what, what's my training, what's my diversity policy, and and not necessarily the why and translating the why into value creation for the company, right? And that's really what, from a financial reporting perspective, investor perspective that they're looking to see. So like I said, I think that's both the challenge and the opportunity. Um, How can companies take the vast amount of data that they have at their fingertips derive the right insights, take actions, set goals, and stay accountable to those goals, um, not only for the growth opportunities for the company, for investors, but also for people themselves, um, right? Just thinking about the broader societal impact. All right. I feel like that's always like the cliche, but that's true that every, you know, risk has opportunities. So (laughs) I definitely agree with that. Um, Andreas, how about from your perspective? I think I'll use this opportunity for a commercial for episode four, which right. is that uh, I know when some people listen to this kind of a discussion, they there's maybe a little bit of skepticism on the quantification and just say too hard, can't be done, impossible. Um, and I think what we'll talk about in episode four is that uh, there are sophisticated acquirers out there right now who are the entire investment or a large portion of the investment thesis when they buy a company is that I can enhance the the value of the human capital of the target company and the target company is not doing that currently and I know how to do it. And those types of buyers, they don't do that based on qualitative analysis. They do that based on they've done something quantitative to demonstrate that the premium they're going to pay can be justified by the things they're going to change um, in a you know in a measurable way because that's what they're going to have to sell to the banks in order to get the financing and, and all of that. So that's what we'll talk about, and I think that's uh, I don't know really bring some life into it from my perspective. Well, and I think I'll give a sneak peek to the audience that there's actually some practical things there too that we're going to talk about that you can actually do. So this is not just for companies being acquired. So I definitely recommend you tune in again next week. And in the meantime, Sheree, Andreas, as always, such a pleasure to have you on. Thanks for joining me today. And that's our show for today. Tune in next week for more fresh episodes so that you never miss any of our audio content. Follow the PwC Accounting Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And to stay up to date on all our latest accounting and reporting news, sign up for our newsletter at viewpoint.pwc.com. From Thought Leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.